Hey there, I just wanted to give you a quick lecture on what life was like in the antebellum south. So once again, antebellum, it means the period before the war. So this is quite simply what's going on in the southern states before the war begins. And we're going to start first with what I call the cotton revolution. Basically, cotton is going to be king in the south for a good period of time. You have settlers living in Alabama and Mississippi by the 1830s. You have settlers living in both Louisiana and Texas by the 1840s. Most of these people who are going to move from the East Coast of the United States into Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, they are just independent farmers. The fancy word for independent farmer is yeoman farmer. And the reason they're gonna move is quite simply population growth. All of the good space on the East Coast has been taken. So those who are up and coming or those who have uh, moved more recently, they have to move further inland to try and find a place to farm and a place for their animals to graze. Most of these pioneers are actually gonna move into wooded areas. I mean, think of North Georgia, think of Northern Alabama, think of Northern Mississippi, it, it's mostly going to be trees and woods and, and forests, which means there's not going to be a lot of slavery. There's not going to be a lot of cotton farming in those areas. But cotton is going to become king. And Eli Whitney is really going to help this in the year 1793. Uh, the cotton gin is this machine that lengthens the cotton fibers and allows the seeds to fall down basically into a bucket. And this is going to change the way cotton is grown. There are a couple different types of cotton out there. One is called long staple cotton and one is called short staple cotton. Uh, long staple cotton, it has a longer growing season. It feels a little different. It's a little bit softer and it has fewer seeds. Short staple cotton, it's a little bit more rough. Uh, it has a shorter growing season. And because you're going to harvest it quicker and sooner, it's going to have more seeds in it. Another big difference between long staple and short staple cotton, the area that long staple cotton can grow is very limited. It has to be a place with a long growing season, which means basically along the coasts. The cotton gin and the ability to remove those seeds from the short staple cotton will allow cotton to grow into new areas, such as southwest Georgia, southern Alabama, southern Mississippi. So really, Eli Whitney and his cotton gin is what allows cotton to spread. Now, why does it spread? There's a demand for it. Something like 75 to 80 percent of all cotton grown in the American South is going to be shipped overseas to England. The rest of it's going to go to New England. Very, very little of it is used here in the South. A secondary thing that's going to spread cotton, uh, the value of tobacco starts to crash. So those Southern farmers, they need to have a new cash crop, and that's going to be cotton. Now, wherever cotton goes, slavery is going to go as well, because slaves, by and large, are going to become the economic workhorse of the South. And between 1820 and 1860, there are over 2 million African American slaves who are forcibly moved to new states such as Alabama and Mississippi and, and Arkansas and things like that. What are the social relations like in the South? Um, you've got really four groups of white Southerners. You've got planters, You've got small slaveholders, you've got the yeoman independent farmers, and you've got poor whites. Planters are traditionally going to be defined as those that own 20 or more slaves. It's a really small percent of the population. I know TV shows and books and movies about the white South before the Civil War makes it seem like everybody has just bucket loads of slaves, but very few have 20 or more. Uh, that's about 5% of the population. If you're somebody familiar with the University of West Georgia, the Bonner family, they were one of the wealthiest people in Georgia, and they had something like 40 slaves on their plantation, which was where the University of West Georgia sits today. These planters are very often in debt. Uh, it's not because they don't make money, it's because they're spending so much money. Uh, they're trying to always buy better land. They're trying to do what they can to increase profits. And they're often gone doing business deals or working 
and overseeing their, their plantations. That means that the lady of the plantation, known as the plantation mistress, is actually doing much of the day-to-day -day work. And the fact that the plantation mistress is running the plantation, that's why that cult of domesticity never really comes to the South. Below the planters, you got the small slaveholders. They're gonna own up to 20 slaves typically. That's a little bit more the population, roughly 20% or so. And because they have the second most money, they're gonna have the second most slaves as well as the second most amount of land. Small slaveholders, they are, they're kind of different depending where they live as far as how they act. If they're in an area with a lot of planters, they're going to try and live more like the planters so that they fit in. And if they live somewhere where that's mostly those independent yeoman farmers, the small slaveholder is going to act more like them. So the small slaveholder, they kind of, almost like a chameleon, they're going to change how they live depending on who they live near. By and large, the yeoman independent farmer, that's the largest population makeup, 60% or more. Uh, they don't own slaves. Sometimes they own enough money to rent or borrow a slave during harvest. But for the most part, they're going to do their own work on their own farms. And typically their farms are somewhere between 50 to 200 acres. Then last but not least, you have the poor whites. Poor whites are the ones who don't own any land. They might be squatters just living on somebody's land illegally. They might be laborers working for one of these other people. Uh, but they're about 10% of the population. They're usually um, you know, illiterate. They're usually not very well educated. I'm going to skip this video, but if you're interested, it's by NBC News called Rich and Poor Whites in the Pre-Civil War South. And it talks about how poor whites and slaves actually don't live that differently from each other. Now, as you could probably imagine, the planters, they're the, going to be the ones that control society. Even though they're the smallest population, they have the money, they have the political power, they have the economic power. So everybody is going to look up to and defer to these planters. And part of the reason that poor whites and independent farmers were okay to go along with the system is because everybody from the bottom to the top of the white population want to keep control of slaves. They want blacks to be seen as inferior. They want slaves to be at the bottom of the ladder no matter what. And even though the poor whites and the slaves live a similar lifestyle, if you treated the slave as a person, that would mean that they were equal to those poor whites, which means that everybody was equal, which would completely destroy and crumble Southern white society. To wrap their mind around the idea that slavery was good and that uh, you know, slaves were beneath everybody else, there were pro-slavery arguments. Uh, slavery was good. It, it created domesticity. It uh, soothed the savage beast, is something they would say. Uh, they would also turn to history. They would say the Romans had slaves, the Greeks had slaves, the slaves are found in the Christian Bible. Israel had slaves. Um, Egypt had slaves. It's okay according to religion. It's okay according to history. So it's okay according to us. And then there were some who said that slaves were treated better than those wage workers in the North. The argument there was the slaves were given everything that they needed. They were given food and shelter and clothing and the job. And the wage workers in the North, they had to struggle for all that and pay for it. But that argument falls apart when you realize those wage workers, no matter how bad they had it, they were free and able to live on their own. There are Southern churches where slavery is preached and supported from the pulpit. And that is a common thing all the way up to the Civil War. I'm going to skip this video as well, but this is called The Invisible Plight of Poor Southern Whites. You can find it on YouTube pretty easily. And let's go to the other part of the Southern society, and that is slave society. Now, when you try to explain what it was like to be a slave, it's hard to do because there's so many variables, and I have some of those listed here. But generally, it, it comes down to who was the slave owned by and how were they treated, what type of work did they do, and where did they live? So it's a complicated thing that you can't just simplify. 
But with that being said, I'm going to try to simplify it as much as possible. But I encourage you to try and do some of your own research on this so that you can see how different everybody's conditions were. Um, material provisions. Uh, the food that a slave ate was very, very basic. Uh, it's just basic pork, cornmeal, coffee that often wasn't actually made from coffee grounds, and molasses or corn syrup for their sweetener. Uh, most slaves were allowed to tend their own vegetables and have a vegetable garden, but that was only able to be worked after the main work is done. And there are a select few number of slaves who were able to hunt for meat to supplement their, their um, plates. Clothing. It's two cotton shirts, two cotton dresses. If those shirts or dresses get messed up, you have to fix them. And if you can't fix them anymore, then you go without till the next year. Uh, men are going to be given usually two pairs of canvas or burlap pants. Next time you go to the store, go to the uh, produce section, feel those burlap sacks that the potatoes and sometimes um, onions come in, and just feel how rough they are, and then imagine having to do work in a field wearing that. Straw hats are going to be given to keep the sun out of your eyes, and you're not going to get any shoes until the weather turns cold, and the only person who decides that the weather is cold enough is either going to be the plantation owner or the overseer and then the shoes will be handed out. Housing. Uh, think of the largest room in your house. It's probably going to be about 10 feet by 20 feet or thereabouts. Uh, maybe the large bedroom in your house. That was where the slaves lived. That was a one-room cabin. That one-room cabin is going to have a wooden door, no glass in the windows, just shutters that are full of leaks. Uh, the floor is going to probably be dirt or wood covered with dirt. The walls are going to have mud in between the boards to try to keep the air out. And handmade furniture, handmade beds. The slave is going, uh, quarters are going to look very much like you might find in a, in a stable for a horse or something like that. And that bedroom or that living room that you're thinking of is typically going to be shared by not one but two families. Uh, because of the poor nutrition, because of everybody being crammed together, and because of being exposed to the elements, there's a lot of disease. Uh, and if somebody gets sick on a plantation, then that sickness is going to spread and usually become very, very serious. Two different types of labor you're going to need to know. I'm telling you right now, this will be a question on the final exam. There's gang labor and there's task labor. Task labor, you're going to be doing an individual task. It's the easiest way to remember it. Task labor, you do an individual task. And that's what happens in rice plantations and sugar plantations. Uh, everybody's going to be doing a separate chore, a separate task. Everybody has to finish one thing before you can go on to the other. With gang labor, everybody works together in a gang. So gang labor, you work in a gang. Everybody works together. That's what you think of when men and women are working together out in a cotton field or something like that. They may be doing different jobs, but everybody is working together to get the job done. So that's going to be cotton, tobacco, things like that. When do you work? It's basically sunrise to sunset. And depending on the time of year, depends on what you're doing. Uh, spring and summer are going to be the hardest hours because that's when you're planting, tending, and harvesting. Uh, fall after the harvest is still difficult because you have to, you know, preserve and, and get all of the harvest usable. And then also you have to prepare for the next growing season. So you have to put the seeds aside. You have to fix any materials that might need to be fixed. You have to sharpen the blades, whatever it is. The one thing that the typical slave does get if they're working in a field, the a week between... Christmas and Thanksgiving as um, you know a time of rest. What if you're a slave that works in the house, um, you know, a servant or an artisan? Your job is both easier and harder. It's easier because you don't have to work out in the elements, you don't have to be a field laborer, but it's harder because you're always under scrutiny because whoever the owner is is always watching you. And very often those house servants, the, the slaves that work in the houses or as as skilled artisans, they're going to be 
the ones who are receiving like unwanted advances both from men and women. There are some slaves that work in cities, cities like Savannah or Richmond or even Charleston. There are slaves working there. Typically a slave working in the city, they have more freedom of movement. Uh, they're also allowed to take part in like tin smithing, copper smithing, blacksmithing, things like that. Some of these city slaves work in factories and a skilled slave has the highest value. There was a silversmith that was sold in Charleston, South Carolina. I can't remember the year, but the records are there. Uh, this silversmith was sold for like $26,000, which is several million dollars today. I'm going to skip this, but this is the story of a slave at Wessington Plantation. It's about a slave who actually runs away and what happens to them. And it's based on a true story. Now, controlling slaves. This is going to sound controversial, but it's not the physical conditions of slavery that were hard because the physical conditions of a slave were very similar to the physical conditions of one of those independent farmers or a poor white. So what made it so bad? It's the mental aspect of it. At any moment, a slave was subject to be whipped, branded, caged, denied food, anything else. And in the year 1830, a North Carolina Supreme Court case called North Carolina versus Mann. The Chief Justice of North Carolina wrote the opinion, his name was Thomas Ruffin, and he basically said, the power of the master must be absolute, meaning that a slave owner has absolute authority, can do whatever they want to their slave. Their slave uh, is not a person, and therefore the slave owner cannot be guilty of committing a violent offense against that slave. So with that, uh, the aspects and the treatment of slaves just gets abysmal. It goes from bad to worse. So a slave, all of your movements will be controlled. There will be people searching for you at all times. You have to do anything and everything your master says, and you have no idea what's going to happen to you. You have no idea what's going to happen to your family. You have no idea if you're going to be sold the next day. You have no say whatsoever. Now, some masters are viewed as good because they treat their slaves like valuable property. Some masters are bad because they treat their slaves like replaceable or breakable property. But whether it's a good master or a bad master, the same thing is true. They both treat their slaves like property instead of people. Now, there is resistance. And I'm going to move this little bubble over to the side. There is resistance. There are individual resistances. Individual workers might slow down the work on purpose. They might sabotage the work. They might run away. Uh, Frederick Douglass actually runs away several times before he escapes to freedom. There are cases of theft. There are cases of arson. There are cases of murder. There are several rebellions that happen, but I'm just going to have you know these three. And yes, you do need to know these three for the final exam. Prosser's Rebellion happens in August of 1800. Gabriel Prosser is in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, he has some freedom of movement, and he and some other slaves, as well as poor whites, are going to hatch a plan together to burn down the city of Richmond. Uh, the plan is discovered. It rains the day they're going to do it, and all the leaders are rounded up and executed. In spring of 1822, Denmark Vesey, uh, he is a free black living in Charleston, South Carolina. He won his freedom in a lottery, and he, along with some others, are going to plan a rebellion in Charleston, South Carolina. Plans leak, the leaders get executed, and it doesn't really go anywhere. Finally, you got Nat Turner's Rebellion, which is the most famous. That's in late August 1831, and you have read about that. Uh, Nat Turner was an educated black man who was a slave, but also a preacher. And he feels that it is his duty, his calling from God to lead a revolt. Well, this revolt lasts two days. Hundreds of slaves gather and join. And the plan is to march to Florida. Well, they only get a couple of miles down the road. They kill 60 people. The rebellion is caught. Uh, the people are captured and arrested. And Nat Turner and other rebellion leaders are going to be... Um, put to death. 
And it's really Nat Turner's rebellion along with that North Carolina versus Mann case in the Supreme Court of North Carolina. That's what is going to turn the plight of a slave from bad to worse. All right, I tried to keep that short for you. Uh, you'll have another videos coming out for Manifest Destiny here uh, shortly in the next day or two. Uh, thank you for watching, and as always, if you have any questions, send me an email. I look forward to hearing from you.